morning. Good morning, Sacramento. Welcome to Legalese with Mike Chastain. We have a special edition this morning. We are filming live at the Mandalay Bay Hotel in beautiful Las Vegas on this holiday, this Labor Day weekend. Uh, and I have a very special uh, panel of guests today that are going to be joining us uh, so that we can talk about something that's really critical to any entrepreneur or actually anybody on the planet uh, anymore, and that is cybersecurity. You know, how safe is your phone? How safe is your, uh, hey Google, you know, what's the weather uh, in your house? Uh, how safe are your computers? So we have a great uh, panel, and I'm going to introduce them all from uh, from my left, we have Vince Fong, who's going to be speaking. Uh, next to him is Greg Hanna, and I'm going to give each of these gentlemen an opportunity to introduce themselves and their, and their company. And we have Will Nobles in the beautiful blue suit, and Mike Unbinder Schatz. Close enough, right? Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> uh, so, um, Vince, why don't, why don't you start off by tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your company. Sure. Uh, hey, I'm Vince Fung. I'm the founder and CEO of Debian Information Technology. We are an IT managed services provider, managed security services provider based in Canada. Uh, we service uh, hundreds of corporations, uh, providing them with security services all across uh, the country. And I uh, also have the pleasure of speaking at uh, numerous uh, conferences as well as uh, industry events and uh, internal corporations to share my message about cybersecurity, how to stay protected, and how to ensure that your business doesn't fall victim to cybercrime. Great. Hey, hey, my name is Greg Hanna from Boston, Massachusetts. I'm the founder and CEO of TOS C3. Been around 33 years. I own three data centers in the Northeast, and I've had the privilege of speaking at some amazing corporations with these gentlemen, as a matter of fact, such as NASDAQ, the Harvard of Boston, and the New York City Bar Association. Uh, our company focuses on three main areas, cybersecurity, cloud computing, and data compliance. Will. Hey, uh, Will Nobles from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my company is Vector Choice Technology Solutions. Uh, we're an outsource IT and Sony managed services company. Um, we have offices in Atlanta, Baton Rouge, uh, North Carolina, and Northern Virginia. Um, cybersecurity expert, uh, I've, taught, I've spoken at places like West Point and uh, NASDAQ, and I started a movie with my good friend Michael here at um, a movie called Cybercrime Movies, um, and you can go to cybercrimemovie.com, and it also is on Amazon Prime. Hey, Michael. Hey, Sacramento. I'm Michael Linebinder Jets. My company is Joe Becca Technology Group. We're located in the great Philadelphia area that's Philadelphia. Pennsylvania, not Philadelphia, Mississippi. Not familiar with that, by the way. Um, and I, too, uh, Jobeck Technology, we're around 23 years. We're a managed service provider, IT security company focusing on cybersecurity and general IT support for uh, the professional service industry. And uh, we're actually, although the film's available on Amazon.com, It's early Sacramento. Um, we're having a fun enough area premiere on September 11th with Cybercrime. So for all you folks in Sacramento who are just dying to go to the Philadelphia area near September 11th, you should get in touch with Mike Chastain here. <laughs> and he'll, uh, he'll connect you with me to come out and check the film out. Yeah, so I actually have family in Philadelphia, and so we, we may have some guests just watching. Um, you know, family's always a good... Uh, a good source of uh, people watching, so who knows, or maybe people uh, actually know who to see them, so it may be very helpful. So, you know, what kind of brings us together today, <clears throat> actually this weekend, and, and I talk a lot about this on the show, is mastermind groups. You know, the, the uh, value of getting other people, and especially people from other industries, uh, together to, you know, learn from, every, from, from them about what do they do that makes that their businesses work? What are you know? What are the mistakes that they've made so that we don't have to duplicate those? Uh, that's always a nice thing to avoid, and and that's how this group wound up getting together. This is uh, essentially we're meeting here as a mastermind group to improve our businesses, improve our uh, our speaking, which is always very very important. So <clears throat> the first thing I'd like to ask you guys is, you know, what do you think is the number one thing that uh, a business should be concerned about as far as their, uh, their 
cybersecurity issues. Anybody want to take yeah. all that? I'll start. Uh, I think one of the biggest threat to companies is uh, ransomware. Um, you know, how that happens is it's going to come through email, you're going to click on a link, and it, sometimes it doesn't happen automatically. Um, it might set dormant on your network for a while, and it will spread. Uh, it will spread quickly. What the uh, crypto locker virus is what it's called, there's different uh, types of it. Uh, it will lock your files, Word documents, PDFs, everything, your intellectual data that's important to you as a business, um, and, and, and not locking down your environment where everybody has access to everything. It will immediately spread between all servers, all computers. Uh, matter of fact, I had a client um, that a prospect called us uh, a week ago and said, you know, can you guys help us? We got hit with a ransomware. And he and we're like, yep, you got backups. He's like, unfortunately, we haven't had a backup in a year. Um, now, a business not having backups, you're thinking that's crazy, but that's so common. These guys can tell you it happens all the time. And uh, so we started looking at it, and not only did they get hit with one crypto locker virus, it was three. Three, um, and, and they had to pay the ransom. Now, uh, one was a $5,000 ransom, one was a $10,000 ransom, and the other one was three Bitcoins. And a Bitcoin is $10,000 each, or $30,000. Oh. So to what they paid us and the ransoms, in one week, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 shot uh, in one week on money that they could have saved if they were just doing backups. And, and, and don't think that you know plugging a USB drive in and backing up the back because the virus was spread to that as well. So I think ransomware is one of the biggest things uh, that businesses uh, take themselves from. Yeah, I think you guys all agree? Um, oh, absolutely. So I, I just uh, had a recent experience with a prospective client that, uh, oh. I mean, it would be funny if it wasn't so sad, but a uh, similar situation to what Will's uh, prospective client, I guess a now client, reached out to him with. Um, we had a company reach out to us because they had been hit as well. And they actually said, um, we think our IT guy is in over his head. And I, I tried to work with them, you know, tried to give them some support on the phone. But the way it ultimately played out, and, and this is, this is, I guess, the immediate person to the order category of story, was after being down for two solid weeks and losing four months of data because it turned out they didn't have a good backup since before the, I don't know, three months ago or whatever it was, um, their IT guy, the one who was in above his head, made a change to their backup and they thought that they were in good shape. Then. So, you know, I look at stuff like that and I go, well, if the guy was in over his head and he wasn't making a recommendation that could protect you in a situation like that proactively, are you just asking? Yeah, I would say so. And, uh, don't, don't think your uh, your nephew's brother uh, is going to do a good job taking care of your back. But make sure you have a real company that is taking care of your IT. Uh, just like you don't want to go to the doctor, and, and uh, you don't want to go to a brain surgeon, and, and or go to the dentist for a uh, brain surgery. You know, right. you got to go to the right specialist. Right. So, I mean, my I don't know anything about uh, you know about computers really, but. What I do know is that it's getting more and more complex. You know, there, there's all kinds of you know, different software programs, and every time we change a software program, there's this huge learning curve, and that's just on the user end. So I gotta, I gotta think that the back end is much more complex. Is that, is that part of the challenge that people are having, um, Greg? You know, with the, the complexity of uh, the software that people are using. Now? Absolutely. I mean. Computers change every six months. The technology is just moving exponentially, and cybersecurity is really a layered strategy approach. So if you think of it as an onion, and each outside layer, let's say the furthest outside layer of the skin, and the firewall, and you move into a subsequent layer of like intrusion prevention systems, detection systems, and move in, move in, your data sitting in the middle. So the concept is you're never going to let anybody keep everything up 100%. I mean, I'll tell you right now, when I was speaking with Suzanne Summers at the Harvard Club in Boston, I said, hey, Suzanne, I mean, you're really into technology. You know, Facebook Live, Instagram, have you ever been hacked by ransomware? She said, not yet. <laughs> not yet. And, and that's Smart just woman. the truth, right? Isn't that the key? I mean, it's not yet, right? The, the point is, um, is you probably have 
already been hacked and you don't even know. That's okay. Yeah, I, uh, you know, so let me, let me ask you this, that's, do you, you know, I'm a small business, right? I've got eight employees, um, you know, so we got eight workstations. I mean, we're, we're a small business, so, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's easy to kind of go, well, nobody would bother with me. A am I being a fool by saying that? Yeah, that's the that's the <laughs> there. Yes, yes, right. Yes, yes. <laughs> Small, nobody's bothered gonna bother to hack us. Right. Yeah, nothing is true. But most most companies they call it got word documents and they sell files. So what? And what they don't realize is, is an attack like a ransomware attack that, that Michael and Bill talk about is potentially a business ending disaster. Because what they'll do is they'll walk you out of your systems that are critical to allow you to continue servicing your customers. Uh, for example, we may uh, actually save a uh, small regional airline uh, about a year ago where uh, this company called us out of the blue. I've uh, never talked to them before. And they were in a panic because they were down for over three days. And what happened was uh, the hackers had gone into their systems and encrypted all of their, um, their servers, including their aircraft maintenance database. Uh, fortunately, they had 10 days worth of potential aircraft maintenance records. That allows their planes to keep flying, but when those records run out, they, they would have had to ground all of their planes if they didn't turn up on the parts and get swapped out. So they call us in a, in a big panic. Uh, we we managed to mobilize a, uh, a team to have to go in and do all their files. Uh, it was a very, very expensive event just for us to uh, help them pay the ransom on their behalf and recover their systems. But it was just in the nick of time that we were able to get their, their database back up and running. Allow them to keep flying. Had we actually missed that, they would have been in breach of millions of dollars worth of contracts and would have lost everything that this 52 year old, 52 year old company had actually built because of this one little ransomware. So the, the the danger isn't, or the issue isn't that my my data is valuable to someone else. It's the question that it's valuable to me, and if I can't get it. And I'm basically out of luck. Yeah, you they, uh, okay, so have you ever, I don't know if any of your listeners out there have ever seen the amazing Francis Ford Coppola film conversation from 1974. He did it in between the two Godfathers. And it's a film about um, a surveillance expert who was, who was able to uh, pick up data on microphones from a big distance. And this really underscored what it was like in the old days of espionage, which was that whoever the criminals were, they were going after your data because it was valuable to them. They wanted to get the competitive advantage. Chrysler wanted to know if Ford was dropping their wings on their car, you know, or what the new style was going to look like. Well, ransomware proved that the, the brilliant shift on the part of criminals was that they realized that the data didn't have to matter to them, it has to matter more to you. And if it matters a lot to you, be it as an individual basis, you've got all your family photos, or a business that's in some documents so that they can keep planes flying in the air. Whatever it is, they know that that's more important to you. So if they can lock it up to ransomware, and they don't have to get a lot of money. I and mean, in Will's case, his prospective client had to pay $45,000 in ransom, but sometimes it's only $500 or $1,000 or $5,000. Oh, we'll just pay it, we'll get our stuff back. Sometimes you may have to, but then you've identified yourself as someone who pays the ransom. Yep. Low-hanging fruit. They're going to go after you again. Absolutely. Uh, and, and don't think you're going to negotiate with them. Uh, two things to learn of pain is, one, they're going to come after you again. So you've got to be more careful and add more layers of security. And then also trying to negotiate and, and say, oh, I'm not going to pay it. Uh, City of Atlanta uh, got hit with $50,000 at the start. They ended up paying $3 million uh, for this ransom because they felt they were going to be able to negotiate the way out of it. And what happens as soon as you click on it and the page, it starts, a timer starts turning. And you have so much time to pay the ransom. Uh, and sometimes it might start at 5,000 and in 48 hours it'll jump to 10 and then it'll jump to 20. So you don't don't gamble with it. If, as soon as you get hit and you don't have a backup, call a specialist and get someone in there to uh, go ahead and pay it. And it, it's you, you don't pay it with credit cards or, or a check. You have to get paid Bitcoins. Uh, and a lot of times it's going to a Bitcoin ATM. I mean, I had, my techs had to take $10,000 in cash and, and 
stick hundreds and twenties in a Bitcoin ATM to, to buy the uh, certificate uh, code to pay your Bitcoin. So, and, and there's no tracing it. There's no, right. you can report it to the FBI, um, but it happens every single day. Wow. There's a scary add-on to that. Right? But in July, there was a new strain that came out overseas in Germany. It's called the German White. And literally, it's a ransomware that's more of a terrorist attack. The reason I say terrorist attack is because the hacker doesn't, you know, even knows the expression that he can't get your data. This is how this particular one works, is instead of encrypting, that they would have a key and sure, but lock it. It actually writes zeros and ones across the entire disk. And if you had, like, HIPAA requirements, other compliance requirements, you'd have to do with the law. DOD the instruction and that's a process of overwriting the disk five times and zero to one. Well this only does it one time, but it's still it's still pretty pretty serious. You can't get that basically. So they basically, still ask you for sixteen hundred dollars. So you, you so you you pay the ransom and you get nothing nothing, nothing back. You get it. It's gone. The data's gone. Wow. And then on top on top of that, if you have a data breach, I, I I think in California you have to notify all the clients. Especially, especially HIPAA, uh, any, if you're in compliance, the GDPR, HIPAA, ITOR, the list goes on, PCI, yes, you're supposed to notify your clients. Uh, thank you. Yeah, which I mean, you know, again, we're a small we're a small business, but we've had thousands and thousands of clients, you know, um, just postage alone. These sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's where you want to have the right cyber liability coverage. Yeah. We're only a part of the picture here. You have to have the right coverage for that. And then in case something happens and you should plan for it, or when something happens. Uh -huh. um, because I, I will say this, even with all the layers of protection, and I think in Rebecca, we're up to like 18, and I've got nothing on these guys. We just have so many layers. But even with that, none of it is ever really a guarantee. It's just deter, 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 and put in different layers. But with all that in place, even if something were to happen, you still want to run your business at that point. You don't want to be dealing with the costs associated with your thousands of clients and former clients and those clients. Uh, you need to have protection in place that will allow you to do that. So let me, let me ask you this question. So I know um, for just regular burglars, if you put a sign that says, you know, horny dog, <laughs> the odds of you being burglarized actually go down because burglars want the, the low hanging fruit. They want the easy house where they're not the dealing with a dog, you know, guarded by Smith and Wesson. They don't want to deal with that guy either. <laughs> you know, so I mean, those kinds of signs actually matter. Um, do, do hackers tend to move on if they say, oh, this guy's got, you know, got a firewall, he's got all these different layers of security? Does that give you, or do, do, do they see it as a challenge, or does it matter? What, what most people don't understand is cyber crime is a business, and it's, it's really a big business. And if, if you just put in a few layers of security, it makes it more complicated for them to actually attack you. So we want to do better victim. It's just like putting in a, a, a burglary sign in front of your, your house. Uh, you can put in a simple door lock. It actually makes a big difference in reducing how frequently your house might get burglarized. Uh, you can't guarantee that it's not going to get burglarized ever, but it'll drastically reduce the chances. And just by throwing in a few layers of, of good security and ensuring that that's maintained properly and stays keeps you protected, it ruins the return on investment of all those attacks and they'll find a better victim that's easier to have to do. And here, here's the important thing that a lot of people miss. Um, we have a big span of the enterprise, $100,000, $200,000 million dollars in our perimeter business. But what, what's happening is, is that the firewall business is the employee of the team. And now this employee has a key on the board, comes in, Logged in, trusted by my job in the network, and they're sitting, you know, nice and happy in their job. Um, especially at this time of year, it's football, you know, March, March Madness, all these different things. They go onto these websites, and innocently, you know, they can be just surfing a website that's infected with two lines of code that will trigger a download of a malicious malware that's going to, as you mentioned, not necessarily 
execute the data. But it might do two things. It might exfiltrate the data, taking the data, right? So take their promise copy and send it to themselves. Now they have all the data that they can store in the dark web. Then it might just come to the dark web. But then they can sell that, right? So 100,000 medical records. And then for the, the ransomware to sit in the network, the backup, they have to pay. Maybe 31 days later, on the next Monday, everybody's going to pay. The screens are all right. What happened? Nobody did it. Nobody did it. Right. Okay, so that, so, and that kind of gets us to that question is you can do all the, uh, all the things right in your employees are the only plane. Is that really what I'm hearing? So they're, they're always the things. Okay, so um, let me let's just go to that. What do you what do you do to you know or how should one train their employees to avoid being that weak link? Um, just just like you train for their special people. You know, um, and you train an accountant how to use QuickBooks and send them classes. Same thing, you you know, we offer uh, training courses where they can go through and, and watch videos and how to take tips. Um, and then also we send phishing uh, and emails out. It, it's fake phishing, it's not going to run the computer. But what's nice about it, we send it out to all your employees. We can see who clicked on it, who opened up the link, who actually put data in. And so based on what they what they did, we can actually uh, force them to go through a training to get to uh, uh, based on what they did because that's where your weak link is. It's the random clicking on everything and not reading what you're clicking on. Uh -huh. um, getting emails that, that, you know, the fake emails might come from, uh, you know, Amazon or uh, Amex or whatever. And it looks like it's a true, you know, it could be your bank, um, you know, uh, Bank of America, Wolfogia, and it looks like a bank email and you're looking at it it's like, okay, I'll click on it. One, never click on an email and go to the link unless you know where it's coming from, and even that is still scary. Um, but pay attention, hover over the link, and uh -huh. see where it's actually taking you. Um, and also look at the email address, because it might say Wolfobia, but it's not Wolfobia, it's just a random condition. Yeah, and I've gotten a few of those where you look at it, and you're like, that's not exactly the way Wells Fargo spells their name. <laughs> W-E-L-L-Z. There's three L's in it where you might not... You know, if you're not paying attention, it looks like Wells Fargo. Um, and then they're asking for, you know, a new code or, or what have you. Now, this is service. Uh, <laughs> uh, We're living the life in Las Vegas. Yeah, I was going to comment on that about, about these misspellings and email addresses and your formatting. So, I often get asked the question, well, the bad guys are making so much money on this, why can't they just pay somebody to make these emails look better? And the answer to that is, when the email looks fully legitimate, so many people click on it. And they purposely reject these formatting errors and mistakes and errors so that if you're the type of person that sees that this is obviously a fiction email and you're still clicking on it, you're a better victim for them. And it's a process of self-selection because if you're a better victim, it means you're less likely to find help remediating it, you're, you're, you're more likely to allow the attack to, to carry on longer so they can do more bad things to your network and steal more information for cause more damage. You'll discard the things going on on your computer that might be a little wonky after you've clicked on something, right? Well, that, that's interesting. And so, they have they have a... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, They're smart. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, this is a multi-billion dollar business now, right? I think three billion. Uh, 2019, we get three billion dollar business. It's sure. only smokes, yeah. And so, I think that the, uh, the, the stats actually are that um, last year was the first year that the proceeds of cybercrime exceeded the uh, legal drug trade worldwide. Wow. <laughs> That's really wow. Bad. Yeah. And it's really easy to do. I mean, if you got on the dark web, you can have money there. And you can get ransomware as a service. So now, kids, adults, whatever, they so much money. They're, they're script days. And they pay 500 bucks.
maybe it's with Hawkins. I don't know. You can't you can't see a show where it doesn't have Epstein on it. I guess the reason why I'm leaving the show is Brian's talking about this. And the reason it's it's that way, especially now, in 2019, it's really big with the whole mention of Atlanta. Right? So Florida just got whacked twice in a row. Um, and they're doing things now up against large uh, municipalities uh, and governments that aren't spending a lot of money keeping up to date. They just don't have XP still in 2003 server. And there's another uh, product out now, another ransomware uh, strain called Mega Cortex. And what Mega Cortex is, it's designed against enterprises. And the opening ante for the ransom extortion is 20 grand. And it's gone up to 5.8 million so far. Holy so smokes. It's going after like large uh, institutions, oil uh -huh. companies, Fortune 1000. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing a lot of uh, municipalities get getting hit because their their you know systems are just antiquated, right? They're not they're not protecting them. They want a fixed budget, and and they're easy targets. Okay. And even though these amounts are re are rising up and it's going to the enterprise, it still often starts at the lowest level, at the end user level, and it ties in with the dark web and these phishing emails that everyone's been talking about. So if you think about it, um, we all read about these um, breaches out there. Marriott being one of the recent ones, 500 million records. I mean, I was, probably still am, a Marriott rewards member, yeah. you know, Bonfoy now or whatever yeah. it is. But they've got my data. They've got whatever data I have. You have to know that they have your data. So how can that be leveraged? Well, that data is available for purchase. And the criminals out there, and again, it is a full-time business for many of these criminals, can take that data and at the simplest level, they can craft a more realistic looking phishing email. Yeah. It's still got the same crappy link in there, or maybe it's got the great logo or whatnot, but they've got, they've put in there some little piece of information about me that, you know, significantly, exponentially even increases the likelihood that I'm going to click on it. And right. when that happens, it just starts the whole process. And again, I'm a low-level employee. I work in the mail room at some place, some major corporation, and a month, three months, six months, maybe even a year later, that payload gets triggered. And we, and we talked about the dark web and educate everybody what the dark web is. It's really the internet. It's just, it's not a, you can't go to Google and type in dark web and get to it. Um, but it's really where everything illegal happens. Um, uh, from sex trafficking to drugs to guns to uh, your passwords, uh, credit cards. That's where when people say uh, when you get your credit card stolen and somehow it gets used in another state, it was sold on the dark on the dark web, right? And it, it's a there's fees for all of them. You can go in there and say, I want these ten credit cards, and you, you buy them, and and you pay the fee for it. It's that easy. Um, and we walk we walk into clients, and we do a dark web scan. And a lot of times when I meet prospects for the first time, I take and I put their passwords in front of them. Uh, I literally walk in and hand them the passwords. I, I I met with a CPA firm that was 13 owners of a um, CPA um, firm. And walked in. I only knew one of the CPAs, but I was able to hand them each one of their passwords to them, and they were wow. like, you know. And I look at it and say, that's probably your kid's name, or that's your dog's name, or that's your wife's name. Or, let me guess, that that's your favorite sport. One, you know, one, one gentleman, uh, it was hockey. Um, one, two, three. <laughs> You know, it was capital H, though. Uh -huh. Yeah, all right. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. But, you know, you give that information away on social media already. Right. right. You go to someone's Facebook page, what are they like? Hockey, baseball, you know, whatever. Who are they married to? What's their kid's name? What's their pet name? You give that to hackers before we even try. I'm not saying I'm a hacker, but, <laughs> right. you know, before we even try um, and getting that, you give that to us already. So it makes it a lot easier for us to figure right. out. But we have when you hand the passwords to people uh, um, when you first meet them, it, 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 it's a little intimidating. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's reality check. It really is a reality check. Well, that movie, uh, Now You See Me, or um, where the uh, magicians um, hacked into uh, the big billionaire, and I can't remember who the player was, um, but they hacked into his, his system and stole all of his money because they sat down with him and they got, you know, his dog's name and... And, and they were able to figure that out. Um, yeah, I, re I read recently uh, the book about Silk Road and how they 
and brought that down. Yeah. But behind Silk Road, which you were talking dark web, right, selling drugs and guns and virtually everything else on the planet, um, right behind that is just another organization. I mean, they just pop up the movement. And, uh, and, you know, I represent folks that are you know, in that industry. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a real thing. It's yes. a real thing. Okay, so what, what should, you know, I, as, as a small business, you know, doesn't have a billion dollars, certainly don't want to pay in ransomware, but also doesn't have a huge you know, uh, security budget, you know, what should I be doing to protect my my, my clients and, and my business? Well, what do you have on you now? <laughs> <laughs> Here, here's, not the interruption, but no, no. Here, here, here's the thing, a lot of people say, I'm a small business, I don't have a budget. Right. But it's this amazing, as soon as you hit, you all of a sudden have a budget. Uh, right. And I used to think sometimes I'll drop pennies on the table and then drop $100 bills. Uh, you know, pennies is to your security and right. you don't want to spend it. It's never happened to you or it's never going to happen. But then all of a sudden $100 bills come out um, when it is. The good thing about a managed services company like, like we are, you're not ha you're buying enterprise tools, but you're not having to buy the big dollar amount um, and pay the big the enterprises do. So, you know, we can offer it a lot cheaper, and, and it's it's based on what you have, not what you're going to have in the future. It's we we scale with you. So, not, I mean, no, no, I was I was joking, Billy, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to just add on to that that also for a lot of the companies that we provide services for, we are the outsourced IT department. Now, some folks out there, like I know Vince and uh, Greg, and actually everyone for me is probably more in the enterprise space than Rebecca. But we're all dealing with smaller businesses, too, where they don't have an internal uh, IT department. So the question is, do you want your office manager or the person who's, you know, working in your mailroom or whatever it is, also putting on that hat right. and running the IT, and they don't really know what they're doing, and they're going into Google, and they're looking up, how do I fix this thing? Or do you want to know that you have a rock-solid company behind you? And when you think of it in those terms, it really doesn't cost very much money at all. You're probably an eight-person company, and just and not even put eight-person company can start you out by eight hundred dollars a month, and uh -huh. properly securing your IT. Okay. Uh, and and then it will go up based on the layers of security. Right. But it's not when it looks at you look at the risk that you're taking, um, and look at it. It's you know uh, not the risk of oh okay I don't want to spend the money, but your loyalty to your customers or right. to your clients. Um, that you don't want their data to get out there, and that's what you really got to think about, not just your data, but the, your client's data as well. Okay. So all, most of our stuff is in the cloud. Does that matter um, in this discussion? Well, you know, if, if you read the fine print on cloud services, um, you're going to see in there that they're going to say, you know, we protect the edge, you know, your portal, how to get in, but your data and your information is up to you and your responsibility to back up and make sure it's protected. Okay. Um, so I would check that out, right? So look at the end user license agreement and see where things fall because a lot of people have that misconception. Um, just like they have a misconception that their IT company is taking care of their cybersecurity. I, I see this all the time. You know, we'll take over an account and it's like, well, why are you moving to us or why are you looking for another? Well, because we had a breach. You know, our IT company didn't take care of it. I said, well, did you have a cybersecurity arrangement with them? Were they supposed to be doing this? Uh, you know, giving you uh, next generation antivirus protection and, and dark web monitoring? And are they taking care of intrusion detection and intrusion prevention and firewall policies? And do they have a SIM? Are they, are they uh, oh no. I said, well, you can't expect them to do it, but they right. do, you know, right? right. We all run into that. Yeah, yeah. we pay them to hook up the computers. Yeah. Are, they yeah. Doing, are they doing everything for They're us? They're protecting, <laughs> and that, that's the misconception of, I've got an IT guy. Right. Sometimes that single IT guy's only knowledge is right here, you know, and, and not cybersecurity focused. And, right. and just because they are backing up and, and they're providing your IT support and they're fixing your printer issues does not mean that they're providing cybersecurity. Now, the fact that you're on the cloud is one of the, the, the big steps towards what we now call the modern workplace. The, the way that we work is different. Where all of our, our uh, data is, is stored, where the applications are, is very different than it was even just a few years ago. Uh, but that presents its whole, a whole new set of challenges because 
now your attack surface is not within your company, it's actually now spread out across multiple organizations, possibly in different countries, and now, now you have a whole, whole suite of different things that you'll have to protect. And part of protecting that is putting the right tools on the systems that you access the data from, but another piece of it is, is ensuring that, that, as Greg mentioned, that each one of these providers is backing up the data or that you're backing it up to another place in case they get compromised or something happens to one of the accounts that are used in your organization accessing your data. Uh, the other piece of it is uh, adding extra layers of security, turning on things like multi-factor authentication, where, uh, because the only thing that's separating your employees from a hacker from accessing data on a cloud service is the username and password. And if a hacker gets a hold of it on the dark web or through a phishing scam, they can access that same data and wreak havoc with it by uh, maybe running ransomware on it or deleting and changing records. So turning on multi-factor authentication is a really key piece of it. Uh, what multi-factor authentication is, is where you have a, an app on your smartphone or you put your cell phone number on there and in order to log in you need not only your username and password but also a six to eight digit code that comes on the app or a text message on your cell phone in order to log in and that makes it much harder for the hackers to get in. So, so would that be your recommendation for everybody's workstation that they have this, this two-part uh, authentication? Yeah, on, on all, all the cloud services, uh, Office 365, Google, uh, we're using QuickBooks Online or Sage or any of these applications that you normally run. Uh, most of the good quality cloud providers will have the option to turn that on. And yeah, so here we are in Las Vegas and it's raining. Who would have, who would have thought? Never right? rains in Las Vegas. But it's, but it's dry heat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, amazing. Okay, so um, before we get rained out here, let me ask you this. Uh, Business is, is one thing, but what about is, is just a, an individual? You know, I don't have a business, I'm just a regular guy. Um, you know, what kinds of things should I be, you know, concerned about? I, yeah, I've got Hey Google in my house, um, you know, or, you know, it runs my, my lights and turns my TV on. Um, but, you know, what else should I be concerned about? Am I, am I, am I setting myself up to be a victim as well? Yeah, um, all, all of these, tools that you're putting in your home, uh, use uh, electronic thermostats, these electronic door locks, security systems, are all devices that are connected to the internet. And anything that's connected to the internet is potentially a target for the hackers. So the uh, things that could potentially happen is somebody could unlock the door without <laughs> ever knowing the, the original code, just by hacking into the device. Uh -huh. um, we, we've heard of uh, horror stories where the uh, information that's being fed into these digital assistants like Alexa or Siri are actually being monitored by other people and they're using that information to perpetrate other crimes. Yeah. Are you guys actually seeing that, that um, you know, what I'm talking about at home is, is turning into being used against uh, against me, and I don't necessarily mean me personally, but you know, against individuals? I oh, think, yeah. I'm certain. Okay. Uh, I was just going to say, I think it's an early stage, like uh, some of the early malware that we saw, or the, the early uses of malware was, um, um, I'm, I'm having one of my middle-aged aphasic moments there, <laughs> but basically when ads would pop up. So, uh -huh. so it was, in effect, it was being used for something good. Hey, you, you searched for a trip to Spain, and that was captured, and now we're showing you images of Spain. I mean, it's just advertising, right? What's the harm in that? And what happens is when the bad players think, oh, now we can we can uh, turn that into something more destructive, and so on and so forth. So now they're capturing the information via voice, and I have heard a number of stories of this where people are saying, you know, I was just talking to my friend here in the car, and we were just talking about a vacation to Spain, and you know, the uh -huh. first thing that popped up when I went into Facebook later was an advertisement for discounted yeah. vacations <laughs> to Spain. Well, how long is that going to take before that flips around and gets used? And again, if anyone here has something more tangible on yeah, that, I mean, I, I've it. seen people just, like you said, you know, <clears throat> being at the pool and talking about, I need an ice maker out, out by the pool, you know, and next thing on Facebook, that afternoon, ice makers start popping up. Yeah. Uh, so Big Brother is listening, uh, and I'm not saying the government, but I'm just saying 
they're using all this data and pulling all this data right. in. What, what I would say to you is, in, in, are you at risk at home? Think about what you talk about at home, the conversations you have, what you do at home, and with all the te more technology you put into your house, the bigger risk that you um, give to yourself. Uh, where, you know, going back to hacking computers, uh, you can send a payload to a computer, you click on the link, all of a sudden I can turn on your uh, camera, uh, watch what you're doing, listen to you on the microphone, and also you say, well, I don't know when the light's on. Nope, we can turn the light off as well and still be watching you and listening to you. So uh, <laughs> just, just think about what you do at home uh -huh. that you don't want other people to see or hear. <laughs> Right, right. The, and the tell me if you're at risk. <laughs> <laughs> the Internet of Things puts us all, all of us, in the position of being the frogs in the pot. We're just getting more and more comfortable. Oh, yeah. a camera, that, that's great. I can, you know, I can take it out right now and see what's going on in my house. I can unlock and let somebody into the house through my smart lock system. It's easy, it's convenient, and we just get lulled into this false sense of security. Meanwhile, there are hacks out there that will turn your thermostat up all the way yeah. and not let you turn the air conditioning on and actually have the two systems fighting each other. And I think back when the proof of concept came out, it was only $100 worth of Bitcoin. How long is that going to take until that escalates into the next type of attack? And that affects us as individuals, uh -huh. uh, as well as as it affects your mom, your grandparents, yeah. your family member, cousin. Well, you know, I, I've always found it interesting. People like Steve Jobs and, and those never let their kids have iPads. Steve Jobs never let his kids yep. have have iPads, and and I think that that's kind of telling as to you know we we uh, the the frog in the in the pot is a good example, you know. If you put a frog in a, in a boiling pot of water, right, it'll jump out. But if you just slowly turn that water up, it'll just cook. And, and that's kind of what you know what you're talking about, and what we're doing is we we have we're spying on ourselves functionally and putting all of our data out there. Um, and just think about your kids. Um, when we've got a good friend that wrote a book, uh, "Are Your Kids Naked Online?" And, right. And, um, and it's it's scary. I mean, the apps that um, that can hide, so you can have a clock. And it looks like the clock when you just look at the apps and you scan it through the iPhone, you click on it and it's, you know, uh, something else, uh, you know, uh, that's totally different. So uh, it's, the kids are the biggest, uh, I think the biggest thing, the biggest risk out there. Um, you know, people watching them, you know, you got the predators out there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and protecting the kids is huge. Okay. Yeah, so that's a bit sobering. So we should all take our, uh, our iPhones and throw them in the pool. Let's yeah. just start there. Um, and, you know, turn off. Uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, on the one hand, you're like, well, yeah, you know, we laugh about it. We should throw our iPods in the, in the uh, or our, our iPhones in the pool. But then how do you conduct business? I mean, we kind of built, yeah. we built the monster. And now we're stuck yeah. with it. Yep. You know, it's just protect, protect layers and layers. Layers and layers. Yeah. Okay. So, go yeah, ahead. I just want to share one thought on this. All of us have faced this. Uh, Vince, how long have you been in business? 23 years. 33? 12. And 23, 24 now, I think. But all of us have faced the prospect every couple of years that we're going to be out of business in a few years because computers are getting easier and easier and easier. And we're not going to be needed to do anything. Well, you know what? In many ways, they are easier. In many, we can do exponentially more stuff. But the threats, they just keep getting more and more dangerous out there. So what we're doing actually is stuff that five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we could even imagine. And yet, it's more critical than ever. Unfortunately, it's not the most complex stuff in the world. I mean, it's very complex, but it's a suite of tools that is set of the right professionals. It's a good, good cocktail for success. And how good, and how, how we as, as a society have Reimagine the use of technology for good is unfortunately also being done by the bad guys to imagine how technology can be used for bad and they're always innovating and finding more and more creative ways to exploit technology to make money and take advantage of unsuspecting victims. All right. Well, Mike, weren't you the one to tell me that you know when, when cars first came out, the first people who actually used them were were the robbers, yeah. right? Because they could outrun the horse. Yeah. Any, new, <laughs> any new technology, and so yeah. unless the car broke down, I mean, they had an advantage. You know? Right. Right. And and crime has always evolved to take advantage of new technologies. Early adopters. They're the early adopters. Interesting. Okay. So. Um, 
Wow, the time really flies by. So, um, what did you, uh, what did each, what did you guys go through, and, and and you know, how would somebody contact you if they wanted to? Because you guys can do work anywhere in the country, right? right? I mean, you're not limited to your, you know, where your where your brick and mortar building is, right? So, why don't you, um, each of you, you know, say your name, uh, you know, your business again. Um, how they, how somebody would contact you, what your website is, you know, because. Um, Anyone who's listening to this who's not calling a cybersecurity expert is really not hearing what we're saying, right? No, yeah, this is something you got to do. You know, you have life insurance, you know, because stuff happens, right? You have car insurance. You don't plan on getting in a car wreck, but it certainly can happen, right? This isn't. This isn't. This is even worse than a car accident, right? Because it's going to happen. It's not a question of if. It's a question of when, right? Okay. Very and going back to that question of when, we encourage all business to, to, to seriously look at a cyber policy because the, the threat is asymmetrical. Like we, we can do everything that we can 100% and we have to do it 100% in order to keep you protected. The bad guys just have to find one mistake and they exploit that mistake and they get in and it's all finished. So the, the last line of defense that we encourage every business to have in place is a cyber policy. And uh, talk to your insurance brokers, find out which one is the right one for you to, to keep you protected at the level of your business and for the type of business that you have. Uh, to contact me, uh, I'm located in Canada. Uh, my website is debianit.com, so it's D-E-B-I-A-N-I-T.com, and that's uh, Vince Funk. Great. So my name is Greg Hanna, Boston, Massachusetts. My company is Toss C3, and you can reach Toss at www.tossc3.com or call us at 888-884-TOSS, which is 8677. Will Nobles, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, East North Carolina, Baton Rouge, and D.C. Um, my website and the company name is Vector Choice uh, Technology Solutions. The website is vectorchoice.com, V-E-C-T-O-R, choice.com. And you uh, also email me at wnobles at vectorchoice.com, and my phone number is 877-468-1230. I'm Michael Linebinder Schatz, Joe Becca Technology Group. We're located in Bristol, Pennsylvania, which is right outside of Philadelphia. We service the general five-county Philadelphia area, as well as northern Delaware and central New Jersey. And we do expand a little bit beyond there. But, um, you know, basically, if you want to get in touch, it's www.jobecca, J-O-B-E-C-C-A, dot com. Jobecca is for Joshua and Rebecca, my kids, who don't care about that. Um, <laughs> And you can email me at eschatz, that's E-S-C-H-A-T-Z as in zebra, at jobecca.com, or call me at 215-891-9503. And just to, to follow up, um, Vince, when you're talking about having a, a security policy, you're basically talking about an insurance policy. So if you do get hacked, um, like I know, I, I know our office, we have a, a, a policy for... Um, Professional liability that if, if we get hacked, um, they will pay for contacting all of our, our uh, clients and letting them know, hey, you know, your stuff's out there. Um, that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, Basically, exactly. the insurance. Yeah, because these, these attacks can get very expensive with the new privacy legislation. Uh, if you if you have a lot of records that are stored in your systems that have personal information, you need to contact all of those uh, potentially with registered mail or. Using very expensive sources, so if you have a million records, it could be a, at, a, at a dollar a piece. Even it could be a million dollar cost just to just to contact these people, and, yeah, and, and, and it adds and up be, very quickly. Be very careful because general liabilities, errors and in omission, insurance. Make sure that your cyber policy is separate. Because sometimes they'll bake it in, and I'm not an insurance person, but they will bake it into the general liability, which will not cover you that much. Mm -hmm. um, make sure that you have that separate policy. But like this particular uh, prospect, um, they didn't have cyber insurance, but even if they did, the insurance company is going to say checkbox, checkbox. Did you or you, did you have these things? And uh -huh. if you didn't have it, they're not going to pay out. So you not don't depend on just the insurance. Okay. Um, so a lot of these policies require you to take 
some affirmative steps. Oh, they're going to send you uh, a checklist absolutely. and say, do you have a firewall? Do you have antivirus? Do you do you bat, do you do backups? Mm -hmm. And if you check these check boxes that you, and you don't have it, right. and, and when you get a hit and that you're going to try to file a claim, at that point, they're going to say, well, where's this at? And if you don't have it, insurance policy wipes their hands, they, it's on you. Okay, so you're either all in or you're all out, right? <laughs> I mean, you either do it yeah. and and cover all your bases. So having the insurance policy does you no good if you're not doing all the other steps is what I'm hearing. If you're not being honest on it. Yeah, okay. you're not being honest. If they will increase your rider, so you pay a little bit more if mm -hmm. you don't have it. You know, but if you say you have it, as Will was saying, it cancels it completely. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, the, the thing that really costs uh, companies money is reputation monitoring and credit monitoring that has to be done for three or five years after a known data breach has been reported. So I'll tell you a quick story. I'm fortunate enough to have an amazing guy that works for me. His name's Mike Shula. And he came to me 10 years ago because the business consulting company that he worked with uh, for pharmaceuticals um, got nearly put out of business. They were 53 people. They were eight when he left. Um, and what happened was, and it wasn't a hack, it was an accident. And the accident was that one of their consultants left his laptop that was not encrypted with full disk encryption in a bar. Hey. And they had large companies like Pfizer as clients and Gen Genzyme as clients. And they had to credit monitor millions and millions and millions of records, millions of records, put, put them right out of business. Wow. Now, subsequently, they, you know, Eight years later, they regrouped and they ended up selling their company to Accenture for like 30, 40 million dollars. But they came back from it, but that's just what can happen. Yeah. Wow. They came back from it, but where might they have been? That's right. If that had never happened, yeah. maybe 500 million. That's right. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, I mean, this has been great, gentlemen. I, I, I really appreciate your time and, and doing this. I know you're all very busy, and you know, here we are in Vegas, and we're taking the time to, to uh, discuss these issues, but they're really, really important. You know, um, and I think it's one of those things that we overlook. And uh, so I really appreciate you taking the time to, you know, to share with uh, with our folks um, uh, the importance of doing this, and especially for small business because we're all basically small businessmen, right? And so you know, uh, we got to we got to kind of watch our backs because there are people, and I know because I represent some of them uh, who are who are out to put you out of business. So uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Well, Sacramento, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. We hope you've enjoyed the show. And we will... Bye, Sacramento. Uh, we will be back next week on Monday here on uh, Legal East with Mike Chastain. We will be live on the radio next week. Uh, this was a holiday, so we weren't actually live on the radio today. Uh, but we'll be back on Monday 105.5 FM. We'll see you then.